Welcome everyone to the Spinal Crash Course Series session on respiratory medicine taught by Dr Priyanka. Um, if you look on the top right hand side of the slide, um, that's the link to our Instagram page. So please like follow us and then you'll get um, details of our sessions coming up. Um, and on the bottom left is our email address. So feel free to email us with any questions about the session today or just any questions in general. Um, send us an email and we'll try and get in touch within a few days. Um, and do you want to go to the next slide? So this is the link to our polls for today. Um, so if you scan the QR code, I'll give you kind of a couple of, couple of minutes just to get logged in. Um, I'll post the link in the chat as well. Can you see the chat Priyanka today or no? Um, not at the moment. Don't worry if you can't, a lot of people can't, so I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, great, thanks. Cool, I'll post the link in the chat as well, but I think we're probably good to go. So I'll hand over to you, Priyanka. Okay, hi everyone, I'm Priyanka, one of the F1s, um, working currently in TNO um, in London, but I'll just get started. So this is um, just respiratory emergencies, um, something that you would um, generally see in the hospital, um, maybe on your nights. Um, so yeah, just basically like how you would deal with that. Um, yeah, and we're covering around six topics today. So we can just get started on the First, SBA. Okay, so a tall 35 year old man with a background of five years smoking history presents to Amy with shortness of breath and pleuritic chest pain. Um, the chest x ray shows a left sided pneumothorax that is one centimeter in diameter. What is your suggestion in management moving forward? Chest strain, um, fourth or fifth intercostal space. Um, B, needle decompression, second intercostal space, mid line. C, observe and wait, D, analgesia, E, needle decompression, third intercostal space, mid line. I'll just open the polls for that. Has everyone got the poll? Is it working? B. Um, on mine it's saying it's not open so I'm just going to open it on mine so do you see now okay. there's like the yep it's see. working now so yeah now people have started voting Just give that another minute. Just so people know as well, the polls are anonymous, so don't worry about us knowing who voted what because we don't know. So feel free to just have a guess, even if you don't know. Okay, should we end the poll there, maybe? Okay, so we move to the answers now. So the answer is B, which um, quite a few of you got, which is good. Um, so going through it now, why wouldn't be specific um, answer? So A, chest strain, four to fifth intercostal of space. Um, so you can do a chest strain, but that's only if the aspiration has failed or if the patient has secondary causes. Um, and also if the pneumothorax is more than two centimeters. 
Okay, um, B would be the correct answer. Um, so you would do a needle decompression. As you know, that's in the second intercostal space mid clavicular line. So you would just feel when you put it in there. Um, you wouldn't do observe and wait because the patient has come in with shortness of breath and they do have a history um, of smoking. Um, D, analgesia, you can give that, but um, again, um, you'd want to do some sort of management for the patient. And of course, it's not E because the needle decompression doesn't happen in the third and costly space. It happens in the second mid curricular line. Okay. So um, what is the uh, etiology of pneumothorax? So you have spontaneous, secondary and traumatic. But spontaneous generally occurs in individuals that are quite tall, thin um, male smokers. Um, and it's most likely due to some sort of rupture of the subpleural um, bleb or bulum. With secondary, it will be generally individuals that's common with some pre-existing lung conditions like COPD, cystic fibrosis or asthma. And then, um, of course, there's traumatic. So if there is some sort of penetrating um, injury to the chest, which can be, um, for example, you could have gunshot wounds, stab wounds, um, even iatrogenic. So, for example, if you're trying to do a thoracic thoracic synthesis um, or trying to drain obviously the pleural effusion that can cause um, as a complication of that you may sometimes get a pneumothorax. Um, so just want to say a few more things. So with the spontaneous generally there are some individuals that um, when they come in the tall thin um, you'd be thinking maybe Marfan syndrome um, which is essentially when you have a dysfunction in the fibrillin gene um, and there's some sort of abnormal connective tissue um, in the lung parenchyma um, and if these individuals experience some sort of shearing forces it can cause a rupture of the subpleural um, apical blebs. Right. Um, other causes of pneumothorax as well is um, infections such as um, TB which can cause destruction of lung tissues. Okay, so what is the pathogenesis exactly? So obviously you know that there are two linings. You've got the parietal pleura, which um, aligns the thoracic wall, and then you've got the visceral pleura membrane, which um, covers the surface of the lungs. Now there's a space in between these two linings, and that's called the interpleural um, or the um, pleural cavity. And in that pleural cavity, you have the interpleural pressure. And generally, this pressure is quite negative, um, and in the alveoli, so obviously in the lungs, you'll have the interpulmonary, um, which is generates a much larger pressure. And this basically um, allows the lungs to expand. However, if you've got some air entry into the pleural cavity um, in the causes that we just talked about earlier, so maybe there's um, a traumatic cause or there's a rupture of blebs, that can cause air to enter the pleural um, cavity and cause the pressure to um, basically change which means if the pressure increases in this space, it means that um, the lung won't be able to expand as well. And um, obviously because of this, what essentially happens is that you'll get symptoms such as shortness of breath because there's an increase in workload. Um, you're trying to bring in more air into the lungs because obviously the lungs has collapsed. Um, other things such as on the affected side, you may, um, hear decreased breath sounds or even absent breath sounds really depends on the pneumothorax and on percussion there'll be hyperresonance um, as well as decreased tactile parameters um, due to the increase in air. Okay um, and another um, I guess you can see on the chest x-ray would be this for example the air can um, escape the alveoli and travel along the mediastinum okay um, causing subcutaneous emphysema Right. Okay, um, and with traumatic uh, pneumothorax, I just want to say that there's obviously the open and closed. So you've got um, open where essentially the air, when you breathe in, obviously it's coming in and it's also going out. Whereas with closed, the air enters, but it doesn't leave. So essentially, if you think about it, you've got a flap um, and you're breathing in, um, obviously the air. When, so I said when you're breathing out, um, the flap obviously will close. Um, this is the iatrogenic causes we talked about, um, thoracosynthesis, which will occur through um, when you're doing drains, for example, pleural fusion, that's obviously 
um, another cause of that. And then if you just go on to tension pneumothorax, um, with tension pneumothorax, what happens is you've got this um, pressure which then pushes onto the side that isn't affected, so onto the contralateral side. Um, and so it can compress the other lung, um, it can cause a tracheal deviation, um, it can also compress the heart. And what happens is when the supravena cava is compressed, um, it means you've got a decrease in um, venous return to the heart. Um, and so you have decreased stroke volume, decreased cardiac output. Now, because of that, you've got a backup of blood um, going back. And so you will also see um, jugular venous distension. Okay, so these are obviously some of the symptoms that we talked about. Um, and the chest x-ray of a pneumothorax. Okay. So you can see there's some um, sort of tracheal uh, deviation. Uh, the heart is sort of shifted to the contralateral side. Um, so like the right heart border is being pushed. And you can see the left diaphragm is depressed here as well. So you can see there's no lung markings. That's what you're looking for, really. As you can see on this side, there are lung markings, but here you can't see anything. Okay. Now with the management, um, there is a sort of... Um, a triangle of safety in which you would insert the drain. So it's bordered um, by the anterior border of the latimus dorsi, which is here, the lateral border of the um, pectoralis major muscle, and um, a line superior to horizontal level of the nipple. So it would just be like here, and then the apex of the axilla. So now if you just go in this region, okay. Um, and when we go ahead to do the management, it's all about actually the size of the pneumothorax. And you measure that from the hilum. It's called the two centimeter rule. So if it's less than two centimeters, this is essentially a small pneumothorax. And you would just go ahead and do conservative management. So again, observing um, being oxygen, analgesia, and then you can follow up um, two to four weeks. And also recommend, um, obviously, stopping smoking, so that will obviously help. More than two centimeters, this will be um, something that's a large pneumothorax where you would do needle decompression um, and or chest strain if that doesn't work. Now, if you have an open pneumothorax, um, you can do a partial occlusive dressing as you don't want any more air to enter, um, only to exit. So what you would do is you would just tape um, on the three sides um, and um, when you breathe out, that air can go that will come out, but when you breathe in, obviously it closes the flap, um, so it prevents the air from entering. Um, and another thing to point out is that in, for example, when you're in the hospital and you do enter a duper in the chest strain, um, usually they will do a repeat chest x-ray just to ensure um, that it's within you know, the right area. Um, and also when you're doing, for example, even for like pleural effusion, when you do put in the chest strain, you always want to make sure you do a repeat um, I guess a chest x-ray just to ensure that there's no complications, um, which would be, for example, like pneumothorax would be a complication of thoracocentesis. Okay. So this is the pneumothorax algorithm, which is taken from the British Thoracic Society pneumothorax um, guideline. And just to simplify it, so for primary, if there's no shortness of breath or is less than two centimetres, you would discharge them. If it is more than two centimetres, but they present with shortness of breath, needle aspiration plus giving them oxygen. And usually if that doesn't work, you would then put in the chest strain. Now, uh, for secondary, um, which as we went through, secondary generally means that there are some sort of pre-existing um, lung conditions. If there is no shortness of breath or is less than one centimeters, you would observe them and you would give them oxygen. If it's one to two centimeters, you would do needle aspiration. And if it's more than two centimeters with shortness of breath, you would do a chest strain. So obviously with secondary, it's more severe than it would be for primary, okay. And if you happen to have a patient who's quite in, obviously in an acute situation, and they've got a pneumothorax growing on, you would obviously start with your A to E assessment. Um, first, making sure that the airway patent, you, you can do this by either um, speaking to the patient, checking how they're doing, um, checking if there's any obstruction in the mouth, um, you can do any suctioning if required. 
And um, then moving on to B, checking their respirate, um, also their oxygen saturations, giving a 50 meters oxygen by non rebreather mask, and obviously titrating that according to what the patient requires. Um, and doing a emergency needle decompression using a large bore cannula, second costal space midclavicular line, and then the chest strain goes into the fourth and sixth in the costal space mid axillary line after the needle decompression. And again, as I said, you would do obviously the chest X-ray to confirm the diagnosis. And of course, you know, you just move through your A to E, so C, D, and E afterwards. Okay, so moving on to our second SBA. So you have a 70 year old male with a 40 year pack history as admitted to the ward. He has a background of asthma and COPD. His ABG on the admission shows the following pH 7.25, PaCO2 of 10, PO2 of 9.3, um, HCO3 27. Which of the following describes the ABG results? So respiratory alkalosis. B, metabolic alkalosis, C, type 1 breast failure, and D, type 2 breast failure. Um, and also want to say that PaCO2, um, the usual range is 4.7 to 6 kPa, so kilo Pascal there. Um, and it is a second poll working. Do you want me to try and open it on my side? Yes, please. It's not opening on my phone. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, there you go. It's open now. Okay, we'll just stop the poll there. Okay, so um, 70 year old smoker with a 40 pack year history, and they present with this sort of ABG. Um, so the answer is type 2 rest failure. Essentially, what you've got is obviously um, this is 7.2 pH, which is um, acidotic. Um, we've got PaCO2 of 10, and the usual range is 4.7 to 6. We know that this is slightly raised. Um, PO2 of 9.3, with a normal range being 10 to 6, uh, 10 to 13, sorry, and a HCO3 of 27. Um, so it's not A. I mean, it is likely respiratory, but the pH is obviously on the low side, so it wouldn't be alkalotic. And same for B as well. Um, with C, type 1 breast failure is not associated with hypercapnia, which is obviously what you've got going on here. Um, so the obviously most likely answer would then be D, type 2 breast failure, which is associated with hypoxemia and hypercapnia. Okay, so you've got then the classification of type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. Um, so with type 1, um, it's generally when you have more low oxygen. Um, and you can see uh, the values there. And then with type 2, um, it's to do with low oxygen as well as um, having a um, CO2 that's um, high, so be hypercapnic as well. Um, now, there are uh, different pathogenesis um, in terms of like the mechanisms um, to cause respiratory failure. Um, so the first one would be having an impaired ventilation. 
Um, so which is essentially the process of moving air into and out of the lungs. And of course, this requires muscle contraction. So there is some um, abnormality there. So you've got to think about what things can cause this abnormality in muscle contraction. So maybe some sort of neurological depression, um, nerve impairment, um, things like guillain barre or myasthenia gravis. Um, for neurological depression, some medications, maybe drug overdose, um, which can become, yeah, um, an increased um, intracranial pressure can affect this as well. Um, secondly, you can have impaired gas exchange, um, which depends on the alveoli capillary membrane. So essentially there's an impairment of the CO2 to cross freely. There's some sort of direct membrane um, damage going on, a collection of fluid in the alveoli. Now remember when there's a collection of fluid in the alveoli, it increases the diffusion distance of gases to move from the alveoli um, into the capillaries. Um, and things that can cause this is a pneumonia, as you know, um, pulmonary edema, um, the buildup of fluid there. Third mechanism would be um, airway obstruction. So airway obstruction can be um, caused by many things. So, uh, for example, with asthma, if you have an asthmatic attack, maybe you can have thickening of the airway wall, get a buildup of edema, um, which can cause some um, obstruction. Um, also, uh, the presence of foreign bodies and tumours causing compression onto um, the airways. And lastly, the ventilation perfusion mismatch. So there is um, a basic imbalance between um, the ventilation of air to and from the alveoli and then having the good perfusion from the um, alveoli um, to the capillaries. And here I've just included um, those four mechanisms. And the management of the first would be oxygenation, um, maintaining the um, oxygen saturation by giving them oxygen through um, non-invasive ventilation. And there's many different types. You can have nasal cannula, um, non-rebreather masks, CPAP and BiPAP. And you can titrate the oxygen up. So it usually starts from 24%, 28, 35, um, 40 and then 60. Um, and intubate the patient if required, um, whether it be transported um, to um, ITU. Um, this would generally be if they are tachypneic, have respiratory muscle fatigue, um, and maybe a loss of consciousness as well. Okay. Uh, just wanted to quickly also say, um, Jeremy Sun was. Uh, you may wonder why there is no um, hypercapnia in type 1 respiratory failure. Um, so essentially this is because um, in type 1 there is um, CO2 is being exchanged and expired um, and hyperventilation will increase the rate of this occurs. And essentially if you have one part of your um, lung that's not doing this properly, um, you can have good ventilation perfusion occurring in different parts um, of the lung, which initially, which essentially basically means that um, you'll have normal um, or low levels of CO2. Okay, so moving on to SBA3. So a 45-year-old was brought to A&E after suffering from smoke inhalation, complaining of shortness of breath and tachypnea. The ABG shows respiratory alkalosis, chest x-ray shows bilateral opacities, and the echo shows an ejection fraction of 60%. There's no medical history um, in the background. He works at a nine to five job. Um, what is the most likely um, diagnosis? So A, tension pneumothorax, B, pleural effusion, C, pulmonary edema, D, ARDS, um, or E, P. I'll try and open that up. Uh, pull up, see if it works. Okay, great. Thanks, Anya.
give that an extra minute. Okay, I'm just gonna end that there. Okay, so um, what's really important is also looking at the full history of the patient and not just jumping to the patient as shortness of breath and tachypnea. Um, so they've also come in after suffering smoke inhalation. Okay, their ABG shows respiratory alkalosis, chest X-ray, bilateral opacities, and this ejection fraction of 60%. Now, it's not going to be in tension with thorax. Um, on the chest X-ray, you don't see any of the obviously the pathognomic signs for tension with thorax. There's no tracheal deviation. Um, with B, uh, pleural fusion again, you don't. It doesn't mention anything about bluntening of the costophrenic angles. Um, C, pulmonary edema. Um, you may see bilateral opacities with that, but if we look at the ejection fraction, it's 60%. It's unlikely to be um, a cardiological related issue. Now, D-ARDS um, is a more fitting um, with the history because they have come in from smoke inhalation. Okay, And again, with PE, you need to really look at the full picture. Yes, this patient may be um, having sedentary lifestyle. Um, yes, they have common shortness of breath and tachypnea, but um, the smoke inhalation is not that likely with the PEs, more um, related to ARDS in this instance. Okay, so what is ARDS? ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome. So essentially, um, this is a life-threatening condition um, where the lungs are providing enough oxygen and required for your organs to function. Um, and the causes for this um, could be in pneumonia, viral bacterial causes, trauma, nearly drowning, toxic smoke inhalation, and indirect causes um, like sepsis. So essentially, this is a hypoxemic lung injury. Now, how it works is obviously um, you've got um, an alveoli which consists of um, type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes. Now, type 2 pneumocytes, they produce a surfactant. Now, if there's some sort of alveolar damage because of these toxic substances um, entering the alveoli, it can cause that reduction in surfactant, which is obviously quite important for elastic recoil. Um, and essentially what happens is you get this reduction in surface to volume ratio. And essentially you're not really getting that um, diffusion of oxygen um, that you need into your capillaries. On top of that, with more of these toxic substances, um, you're activating a lot of inflammatory markers and the, you have a lot of inflammation. And so fluid will leak into the interstitial space, which then causes this, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, this increase in diffusion and distance for the gases. Now for ARDS, there is um, something called um, P over F, which is essentially used to um, categorize the severity of ARDS. Now, what it is, is PO2 over FiO2, which is essentially, it's the partial pressure of um, arterial oxygen um, over the um, in percentage of inspired oxygen. So, for example, if you put a pulse oximetry, you see that the patient's um, saturation is 98%, so that'll be 98 over um, the saturation, the percentage of oxygen that they're um, taking in. So if it's just room air, um, that's done in decimals. So it'll be 0 0.21. And then so you would just do 98 over 0 0.21 and you should get a number. And generally, um, in normal individuals, that's more than 400. So this is the criteria that's used for ARDS. Um, it's basically dependent on four things. So the timing, the developing of the acute respiratory failure has to be less than one week of the initial course. Um, secondly, there should be some bilateral opacification on imaging. Um, and you can do a chest x-ray, which would show that. Um, the origin of edema, um, basically, the respiratory failure is not fully explained by um, fluid overload or cardiac failure. So essentially it's non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So as you know, um, 
if you have some sort of pulmonary edema going, then generally there's either the patient's like fluid overloaded, you can check that by pitting edema, um, or there's some cardiac failure. But for this case, it has to be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, and then, as you can see in the bottom here, there's mild, moderate, and severe. And there's different levels for that. All right, so moving on to SBA4. A 54-year-old obese man presents with dyspnea and chest pain, had a complicated cholecystectomy two weeks ago, and leads a very sedentary lifestyle. OBS, heart rate of 102, blood pressure 96 over 70, SBO2 of 90% on room air, temperature of um, 37, his AB shows respiratory alkalosis with hypercapnia. What is the gold standard for this disease in terms of investigations, essentially? So would you do A, a D-dimer, B, CTPA, C, thrombophilia screen, D, observe the patient, or E, do a Doppler? Anya, could you open the fourth poll, please? It is already open. Oh, great. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Just give that another minute. Okay. I'll end the poll that. Okay, so you have a 54-year-old obese man which presents with dyspnea and chest pain. He's had a cold cystectomy two weeks ago and leads a very sedentary lifestyle. And this is his blood pressure. So um, essentially what this is trying to highlight is that um, there's obviously many risk factors for a PE. So you've obviously got an obese man um, he's presenting with the symptoms of PE. Um, Cole suspected me two weeks ago, so obviously he's had some sort of surgery done quite recently. He's again a very sedentary lifestyle. And they've given you the blood pressure here essentially to um, clue into whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not. Okay, so um, it wouldn't be a D dimer. Um, so D dimers are useful, but these tests take a while to come back. Um, and if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we can't wait. Um, so we wouldn't go ahead and do a D-dimer. Um, it's going to be CTPA, obviously gold standard. Clearly the patient has risk factors for VTAs who just went through. It's complaining of chest pain that's occurred. Um, essentially this picks up this, some sort of migration um, of the embolus and also that's caused some sort of inclusion of the pulmonary artery. Um, thrombophilia screen, this can be done, but obviously much later and after you've treated the suspected PE in terms of, for example, what could be causing the PE um underlying um diseases uh with d observe a patient has clinical signs also we have to treat it and a doppler is useful as actually patients with p are likely to have dvt um however it's not the gold standard okay um and another thing to take into account is also like the well score. So um, if the well score is more than or equal to four, um, then that's a high risk. So you would go ahead and order the CTPA. However, if it's less than four, then you would um, do a DDAM as it's a um, much lower risk. Um, they may, um, in SBAs, to make it more tricky. Obviously, this is a more um, easier SBA, but if, to make it more trickier, um, they may try and bring in antiphospholipid syndrome. 
um, and link that with recurrent miscarriages, a prolonged APTT and thrombocytopenia. Um, so that's something to take into consideration as well. Right, so um, in terms of uh, symptoms that the patient present with a PE, it really depends on um, the size of the PE as well. So obviously you have symptoms like dyspnea, tachypnea, pleuritic chest pain. Um, but if a patient has a acute massive PE, which is a sudden um, complete occlusion of the pulmonary artery, you would expect to see something like they would maybe collapse, um, central chest pain, severe dyspnea. However, with acute small PE, um, so this is incomplete, it's not fully occluded the artery, so they still do have some sort of perfusion going on there. Um, you would um, expect to see pleuritic chest pain, some hemoptysis um, and dyspnea. For more of a chronic PE, there will be some exertional dyspnea. Okay. Um, and essentially what happens is, obviously like most pulmonary emboli, they will occur when you have fragments of a thrombus. Um, which uh, will break free from a from the deep venous system. So generally, um, the patient presented with also a DVT, um, typically like in the pelvis or um, the lower limbs. Um, that will travel up um, towards the venous system into the vena cava and the right atrium and into then the pulmonary vasculature. And around, I think it was 70 to 80% of patients who do have um, pulmonary um, embolism or pulmonary embolize will also have um, thrombosis which should be detectable in the legs or the thighs. So that's also really important to also order a Doppler. Now, what does it mean by provoked or unprovoked? Um, so essentially with provoked PEs, um, this is generally in patients that have these um, significant risk factors, so significant immobility, um, they, leave, they lead quite a sedentary lifestyle. You can ask about um, what their current job is, generally if it's more office work, um, if they've had recent surgeries or any traumas. Pregnancy, because obviously it creates a sort of hypercoagulable state, as you can see here. Um, with stasis, hypercoagulability, and vessel wall damage is all propagating factors for thrombus formation. Um, and then unprovoked, um, so this will be in the absence of um, these risk factors. So this person may not even have a um, risk factor or risk factors persistent. Um, and with the treatment, so with provoked, um, that will generally be for three months, um, and then unprovoked would be for six months. So essentially here we can see you've got this sort of um, damage in the vessels um, and you can get a uh, basically a buildup um, of this sort of um, clot formation and then that forms then um, a thrombus and then an emboli because that will break off eventually once you've got um, these factors come in combination. That will break off um, from the deep vein thrombosis into the pulmonary vasculature and you've got a formation of a pulmonary emboli. So that's essentially a cycle of DVT going into the PE. Okay, so clinically, um, when you do an ECG, uh, most of the patients will present with a sinus tachy. Um, there may be uh, some cases, but quite rare, that patients can present with an S1, Q3, T3. Um, now, you've probably heard of this, but you may not know exactly what it is. So essentially what it is, is um, it's S1, so you go to lead one, where you see an S wave here. Um, with right uh, QRS axis deviation. And then Q3, so you go on to lead three, where you would see the presence of the Q wave. Um, and then again, T3, you go on to um, lead three, where you would see um, the inversion of the T wave. Okay, so again, S1, so just look at the numbers, that will basically tell you what lead it's occurring in. And then presence of S wave, Q wave, and T wave inversion. Um, and generally, when you get this as well, you have some sort of right ventricular strain pattern going on, which can propagate some um, atrial arrhythmias as well. Okay, so then how do we use a well score to um, basically tell us how we should manage the patient? So obviously, we went through these are the, some of the risk factors, um, and this is the well score or the well criteria. So again, um, if it is equal to or more than four, um, PE is likely, um, so you basically arrange for them to have the CTPA. 
However, we don't just wait for the CTPA to be done because obviously the patient is at high risk. Okay, so you would do something called um, interim therapeutic anticoagulation. If, however, the well score um, is less than four, so they're at low risk, you would then do the D dimer. But again, this test result may take four hours to come back. Um, and it probably will. So then you would offer, again, interim therapeutic anticoagulation whilst you're awaiting that result. And of course, if that's positive, then you would go ahead and do the CTPA. Um, all right. If the test is negative, then you would stop the interim therapeutic anticoagulation. Now, there are different options that you can choose for um, this anticoagulation, um, apixaban, rivaroxaban, first line. If these aren't suitable, um, and this may be because their EGFR is less than 20, um, then you can choose to give low molecular weight heparin um, instead. Um, and it's also important that when you're starting these patients on interim anticoagulation therapy, that you carry out um, some basic um, uh, baseline blood tests, for example, FBC, um, renal, hepatic function, PT, and APTT. But you don't need to wait for the results of those. You can go ahead and start the anticoagulation treatment. It's essentially because you want to look at the EGFR um, because you'll have to then change um, the anticoagulation that you're giving. Now, if a patient is hemodynamically unstable um, or unstable, sorry, um, this would be you would basically look at the blood pressure. Now, if the blood pressure is falling below 90 systolic, then um, generally seen in massive PEs, then you would go ahead and do the thrombolysis and obviously make sure to escalate to senior first. Um, if there is a repeat um, PE, so a PE is reoccurred, then you would do an IVC filter, which is essentially a device that basically traps clots. Okay. And this is sort of how we would do it. So use a well score um, and you can go down each of these um, to make it a bit more easier for you to understand. Okay. So SBA5, a 37 year old presented with a productive cough, chest pain upon inspiration and fever. His breathing has worsened over the last week. Upon examination, he has reduced breath sounds on his left side and a dullness on percussion, no tracheal deviation noted, and no other symptoms noted. A pleural aspirate was done, which showed a pleural protein level of 36 grams per liter. Which of the following is the most likely cause of suspected diagnosis? So A, P, E, B, pneumothorax, C, pneumonia, D, nephrotic syndrome, and E, heart failure. Okay, so we'll stop the poll there. Okay, so um, hard and red then the most important things from this SBA, productive cough, chest pain upon inspiration and fever, um, likely pointing towards a possible infection going on here. Note there's some dullness on percussion no tracheal deviation noted, and a plural protein level of 36. 
Now, it's unlikely to be a PE, um, seems more of a, um, an infectious picture going on here. Pneumothorax, there's no tracheal deviation noted there. Um, with pneumonia, again, you've got this sort of productive cough, um, fever, and unlikely to be D because nephrotic syndrome is a transudative cause, okay, and the protein level is 36 grams per liter. And same with heart failure, that's also a transudative cause. We'll go um, later on into exactly what I mean by transudative and exudative. But essentially, what is pleural effusion? So um, as we talked about, there's two layers. Um, it's now, so there is the uh, visceral and the parietal, um, and you've got um, an accumulation of fluid in the pleural space. Now, this fluid can either be transudative or exudative. Now, this is what I was saying about transudates have a low protein level of less than 25 grams per liter. And as you remember on the SBA, patient has 36. So this is a exudative cause and they have a high protein level. Okay, and the typical symptoms that you would generally see with the pleural fusion is some sort of breathlessness going on, cough, and a pleuritic chest pain. Now, these are the generic symptoms. Obviously, there's many causes of pleural fusion. So um, sometimes it may be related to the cause, the underlying cause of the pleural fusion. That's what we need to think about. So like exactly what is causing it. Um, is it malignancy? So for example, it could be lung cancer. Is a patient complaining of any weight loss? Have they lost um, three stones? Have they lost um, a few kilograms? Um, any hemoptysis? Um, heart failure could be another cause for pleural fusion, so they may present with orthopnea, so breathlessness when lying down, they may have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, um, some pitting edema going on, showing you some heart failure. Um, infection, as we know, infection is a cause of pleural fusion as well, so there'll be some um, productive cough or they may have um, fevers. Okay, so I split it into two here. Um, so transudative is generally known as the failures. Um, so essentially, obviously the heart failure, you can have liver failure, so cirrhosis. Um, less common ones like um, your thyroid, so you can have hypothyroidism, um, hyperalbuminemia, and something that they do like to test um, in SBAs as well. It's quite a rare cause, but um, Meg syndrome which is essentially it's a benign ovarian tumor that also presents with ascites and perfusion. Um, and with exudate, the most common ones are generally infection. So we're thinking about maybe TB and of course malignancy. Um, the less common ones can be um, autoimmune conditions. So you can think about SLE or rheumatoid arthritis, um, even Dresser syndrome excuse me, um, where you would have inflammation of the sac which surrounds the heart, so essentially pericarditis. Um, and if we talk about more about the symptoms as well, for example, if it's small and moderate pleural fusions, they're commonly asymptomatic, okay. So there's another criteria, fortunately. Um, this is the LIGHTS criteria. So generally, um, if the fluid uh, will be an exudate if one or more of the following criteria is met. Okay. Um, and also, if a patient presents with a unilateral effusion, that's more typically exudative, whereas bilateral effusions are more typically transudative. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Okay. So the LIGHTS criteria, the protein will be more than 0 0.5 um, per fluid over a certain value. Um, LDH more than six, uh, 0.6 pleural fluid over the serum value, and LDH um, would be the upper limit of the normal serum value. So again, if um, essentially if one or more of the following criteria is met, that's exudate. Okay, now for the diagnosis, um, can cause reduced chest movements on the affected side. Um, palpation, you may um, sometimes see tracheal deviation away from the affected side um, if the pleural fusion is quite large. Um, again, percussion will be dull and on auscultation, the breath sounds and vocal resonance may be reduced. And what you would look for is um, at the bottom of the chest x-ray, um, there will be a blunting of the costophrenic angles. And sometimes when the pleural fusion is quite large, um, what happens is the cardiophrenic angle um, may not be visible as well.
Okay, so um, what is the management and treatment? Okay, so for um, smaller fusions, generally you would observe them. Um, for larger transudative fusions, um, you can give diuretics and antibiotics. And um, if it is um, much larger than that, then you can do a full fluid aspiration, which can either be um, therapeutic um, or you just insert the chest strain. Now remember that if you insert the chest strain, um, you would do then the chest x-ray after that, just look for complications like pneumothorax, as we mentioned earlier. Um, and this chest strain that's done is ultrasound guided um, thoracocentesis. Um, I also want to say that once you do the um, pleural tap um, and you see that it's quite turbulent and cloudy, this may clue you in that there's an underlying infection going on. Um, and the plural taps, they're not regularly done, but unless there is a sort of reoccurrence, um, if it comes back or if there's much larger plural effusions. And if these methods don't work, then you can do a pleurodesis. Um, so generally like a last resort. Um, and when you when you when you're going into the stage of doing pleurodesis, you'll be concerned that there is some sort of malignancy going on there. Okay. Okay, so moving on to SBA6. Um, a 60-year-old male presents to a &E with complaints of fever and cough, shortness of breath. He states that he has some hematosis um, for the past three days. He also, um, he also admits to waking up in the middle of the night drenched in sweat for the past few weeks. He doesn't recall weight loss, but mentions his clothes feel a little more loose. His last visit out of the UK was to visit his family that lived in South Africa. What is the most likely pathogen causing this disease? So A, mycoplasma pneumoniae, B, herpes simplex virus, C, streptococcus pneumoniae, D, mycobacterium TB, or tuberculosis, and um, E, hemophilus influenzae. Just give it another minute. Okay, I'll stop the poll there. Okay, so um, this patient's complaining of fever, cough, shortness of breath. He has some hematosis as well, doesn't recall any weight loss, um, also mentions that he has um, visited his family that live in South Africa. So the correct answer is D, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so it's not A, mycoplasma pneumonia. Um, generally this occurs in patients that um, are usually like in, they, they worked in the army or they worked in small barracks. Um, which makes the spread of this quite easy, um, but also you get more pulmonary symptoms of malaise, vomiting, um, and also a dry cough as well. Um, it's not obviously herpes simplex virus um, causing this. Um, with streptococcus pneumoniae, um, this causes a more typical picture of pneumonia with more of a wet cough, um, producing the sort of rusty sputum. Um, mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, this can cause obviously cough, um, the fatigue, weight loss and night sweats. Um, and E, so whilst, um, yeah, so hemophilia influenza is more common in children rather than adults. Okay. 
So tuberculosis. Um, tuberculosis caused by Mycobacterium tuberculosis um, commonly affects the lung, but it can disseminate to other organs of the body, um, commonly affecting the lymphatic system, CNS, as well as the genital urinary. Um, and it's obviously spread with droplet infections so that generally occurs um, in more um, underdeveloped um, regions and obviously spread by coughing and sneezing as well. So it's this region here that's more affected, as you can see in the dark blue. Okay. So um, how does it occur? So essentially you have the mycobacterium is engulfed by macrophages. Um, most individuals will usually recover from this. Okay, um, and those who don't will develop a um, primary TB, um, which can lead to asymptomatic latent TB or extra pulmonary TB. And then you can have latent TB, um, which can reactivate causing this post-primary um, TB. Okay, so these are the sort of clinical features that you would see. Again, um, it can affect your extra pulmonary organs like your genital urinary. Um, central nervous system can cause meningitis. Um, gastrointestinal system can be affected as well. Your lymphatics and, of course, your spinal vertebrae causing something commonly known as POTS disease, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, and it can also, you can also get a different form called Miller-E TB, which is more of a disseminated form. Um, and on the chest x-ray, you can sort of see like this millet um, seed um, across the lungs and it's quite, um, again, a bad prognosis. Um, generally in TB, you have the sort of um, granuloma um, formation as well, which essentially you have, it's basically macrophages and epithelioid cells. Um, um, forming together and the most pathognomic is the caseous granuloma um, and how it works is they basically create this um, immune microenvironment where the infection can be controlled um, and it also allows the mycobacterium um, to survive um, by modulating the immune system and ensuring its survival without damage um, over long periods of time. Okay, so the diagnosis then. So it's really important to ask about the past medical history. So um, about HIV or any other sort of immunosuppressive conditions. <clears throat> um, other conditions like diabetes, um, drug history. So obviously no um, certain drugs like steroids are quite immunosuppressive. Um, their social history. Have they been traveling to um, the sub-Saharan regions, India? Um, are they homeless? Um, and you can also ask about uh, TB contacts, um, if they've been in contact with anyone with TB. With clinical findings, you would um, see the sputum, which would be um, quite prolonged or bloodstained. Um, and other clinical findings, there'll be some dullness to percussion and decreased um, parameters over the um, pleural effusion. <clears throat> Um, other like lab investigations that you can do. Um, so viral screens, as we talked about, um, HIV, hepatitis can all increase the risk of TB. So um, make sure that you can do that as well. Um, with sputum microscopy, so you take three samples, um, at least one in the early morning. It should really be done before you start any sort of um, antimicrobial um, treatment. Cultures can be done as well, although they're not that useful. And of course, um, chest x-rays, which and you can see here, I've included a lot of the um, signs that can be seen in patients that have um, TB. Okay, um, the next day is the treatment and the side effects. So as you know, there's a mnemonic called RIPE. Um, so for two months, it's the four drugs, and then for four months, the two drugs. So rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. And the side effects, try to make it a bit more easy to remember, um, so R for red, um, you need to tell your patients that the secretions will change color, so don't get scared um, and start them off on this drug. So uh, rifampicin can cause red-orange um, secretions, um, and again, it um, can cause a pep, um, hepatitis as well. Isoniazid um, can cause peripheral neuropathy, which is usually why you would also then give vitamin B12, um, such as pyridoxine. And, oh, sorry, <laughs> and um, pyrazinamide, which is um, an hepatotoxic drug and can cause hyperuricemia. And lastly, E 
for E, so E thumbutal, which affects the eyes and can cause optic neuritis. Okay, uh, that's all for me, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Any questions? Thank you so much, Priyanka. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, please also fill in the feedback because it's really helpful for us to still know what you're thinking because most of you watch online now. Um, but yeah, thank you very much.